Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kathy Haig, an assistant teaching professor at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown. I want to welcome you to this event, 10 years on, women's filmmaking in the aftermath of the uprising. It is organized by the Georgetown uh, University Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, CCAS, and 10 years on project and co-sponsored by the Arab Studies Institute, I want to thank uh, all my colleagues who helped me in organizing this event, especially Maddie Fischers uh, from uh, CCAS and MK and my other colleagues at Jadalia who are broadcasting the event uh, at Facebook. Uh, my guests today are three really very uh, prominent and amazing women filmmakers who have documented the aftermath of the so-called uh, Arab uprising, capturing post uh, pivotal moments and everyday life in Yemen, Libya, and Saudi uh, Arabia. And I want to please uh, uh, to uh, pay your attention that when I use the term Arab uh, in this uh, event, uh, I don't refer to a specific race necessary, but rather uh, I refer to an identity with the Arabic uh, language and the geography and history of the so-called uh, the Arab world. Uh, we'll post our guest bios uh, in the chat uh, at the Jadalia Facebook uh, page, uh, but I want uh, to briefly uh, introduce uh, them here and welcome uh, them. Uh, welcome to Naziha Arabi, who is a Libyan British director, producer, writer, and artist who is well recognized for directing and producing award winning film Freedom Fields that uh, follows the three women and their football team in post revolution uh, Libya. Uh, I also want to welcome Sarah Ishaq, who is uh, a Yemeni Scottish film director who directed and produced the critically acclaimed short film Karama Has No Walls uh, from 2012 and the 2013 award-winning uh, feature film The Mulberry House, which deals with her relationship with her family against the backdrop of uh, 2011 uh, Yemeni uprising. And last but not least, uh, Safa Al Ahmed, who is a Saudi Arabian journalist and filmmaker who has directed documentaries for PBS and the BBC focusing on uprising in the Middle East. She was awarded the Willenberg uh, Medal at the University of Michigan in 2019 and the 2015 Index on Cens Censorship Freedom of Expression uh, Award uh, for Journalism. Uh, Welcome everyone. I'm so happy uh, to have you uh, with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank you. Uh, we'll start by asking you uh, to share with us your memories. When were you were, when the uprising erupted and what were your thoughts in context at that time? We'll start with Safa. Ah, well, yeah. I vividly remember it because I was actually uh, in Libya at the time. And uh, it was, I remember walking in the streets and thinking, am I going to be able to experience this one day in my own country? And it, it felt like a completely out of, like an impossible thing. Well, I'm like, I'm sure every Libyan has thought that this is impossible where everybody else in the Arab world, right? In Syria and Yemen and, and everywhere. And, and then, and then I got this email and it was an open call for protests in Riyadh. Uh, and then I heard about actual protests in the Eastern province. And it was just like, is this really possible? And, and so I vividly remember it because then I was in the middle of covering other, uh, other uprisings. And I remember as it was cascading, right? And so it, we were in Tunis and then in Tunis, we flew to Egypt and from Egypt, actually to Yemen and from Yemen, uh, I went to Syria and then it was in Bahrain, of course, in, in between. And it was just, it was so surreal that we were part of a bigger thing. And yet nobody talked about us. Nobody wanted to believe that Saudis were capable of uh, organizing and protesting against uh, the Saudi government. And, and so in a way it was just like my own secret that nobody else was talking about. Uh, unlike everything else in the Arab world that was hoping, happening at the time, everybody was focused on the, the next uprising in the Arab world. But for some reason, Saudi was, uh, was only the counter-revolution. There was no space for a revolution in Saudi. And that, and that was to me quite, uh, I mean, I get asked a lot about why I decided to go back to Saudi. I was like, that was why, because 
nobody else was covering it. Nobody was talking about it. There was like maybe a few articles, but not even a complete context of, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm glad I have a, a Yemeni and a Libyan with me because like we are the least covered, least understood, least, it, it, like nobody was like, who's interested? You know, like who wants to know about Yemen? It's like everybody wants to know about Yemen. You're the only one, <laughs> the commissioning editor who doesn't want to know about Yemen, <laughs> you know? And, and that's, and I find that even more so with Saudi because it just goes against the grain of the stereotypes of foreign commissioners of what they think they understand about Saudi, right? And I, I think that goes for Libya and Yemen. It was like, we are a lot more complex than what you think our governments are, right? Libya is not Qaddafi, and Qaddafi is not Libya. Yemen is not just Ali Abdullah Saleh. Yet, it, it, especially, and I'm talking about the West and white gays, it, it became a shorthand. The dictator is the country, and the country is the dictator, and there are no people. You know, we just happen to be there, and there is nothing interesting about us, and there is no, uh, uh, no complexity to us, no history, no culture, and none of that. And uh, yeah, I just remember that, like I, I, I say specifically on Libya, I know I feel Libya and Saudi is very similar in that we're oil countries, we're small populations, we're so overpowered by the people who, who lead us, right? I, in, I was just talking to my friend uh, who's Libyan here today, and I was like, at least Qaddafi didn't change the name of Libya to the Qaddafi country, right? Like in Saudi, we are the name of the royal family, right? <laughs> like the, the sense of ownership, of the people is so profound that uprising against it is really quite a complex emotional religious context. I mean, not in the Libyan case, but like um, uh, maybe Morocco is similar in that way, right? And so it's it, it, it was really painful to watch that happen in, in, in both of them in parallel uh, with obviously very, very different uh, outcomes. Masiha? Yeah, it's super interesting to hear that perspective um, from when you were on the ground in Libya and and what you were speaking about to do is, you know, the secrecy of an uprising that you can imagine could never happen, but also the thing of like seeming like you belong to a, a name or, or a, a figurehead of a country rather than connecting to a people of a country. And um, yeah, so growing up, my... Um, I grew up in the UK and, you know, whenever at school people would say, oh, you know, where's your name from? And you'd say Libya and people say, oh, Liberia, like, no, Lebanon, no, like Gaddafi. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK. You know, and it's kind of like this thing of like no one knew anything about Libya. No one kind of had an association except, you know, these these kind of uh, these points that people knew, like, you know, Lockerbie or Gaddafi or like, you know, so on and so forth. So, um for me, it was really bizarre because um, in 2010 was the first time I actually went to Libya um, because, and the first time my dad had been back since 1974. So, um, and then I was suddenly discovering, you know, this thing that was talked about in, in secrecy and like the, the possibility of change. And this was 2010 and people were, you know, in my family talking about the possibility of change, but very secretly everything, you know, nervous of each other, not even just like outside people. Um, and at that time, you know, things were starting to move in, in, in um, you know, across the region and, and we, you know, with Egypt and Tunisia and like, um, I don't know. And we were watching, I came back to the UK ha having had my first experience in Libya and was just obsessed, like obsessed with finding other Libyans, obsessed. And before you'd always be running away from Libyans. You'd be like, oh God, I don't, you know, like I'm nervous. I don't know who they're aligned to. I don't know what they're aligned to. I'm scared, like, but you know, this will have repercussions for my family, you know. Whereas like in that point, I was like, I need to find all the Libyans, you know? And um, suddenly you were, you were deconstructing, you know, um, what had been imposed on you by the media and what had been imposed on you by this secrecy and this kind of, and you were, and I was discovering, you know, people for myself, my family for myself. And, um, and I think that was a real, um, an amazing, naive, beautiful moment that, you know, will even whatever has happened since the uprisings, there was this beautiful coming together and that really sparked that this secret idea didn't have to be a secret anymore. And, um, that felt really, um, yeah, I, I, I felt very uh, emboldened and connected to, to my, my Libyan family in that moment. And also to other people in, um, you know, uh, across the region that you were, had this, I don't know, I'd never really 
we talked about this a little bit, Katty, before about this kind of like Arab identity thing of Arab uprisings when, you know, a lot of the people, for example, in Libya that were in the uprisings, you know, um, were, um, you know, Tabu or Tuareg, they weren't uh, ethnic, um, they weren't, you know, Arab. So, but, so I'd always been kind of against this kind of pan-Arab thing or whatever and this homogenization of things. And, but suddenly I was like, oh, I'm connecting with Tunisians and this, you know? So anyway, this, is, this was this moment. And um, I kind of said to my dad, I have to go. I have to go to Libya. Like I can't just keep hunting out Libyans in, in you know, the UK and in this weird way. And so, um, yeah, we, we went during the uprising and then, and then moved there and yeah. But that was, it was very much a, despite everything that's happened in the 10 years since, this was a, a moment of um, naive magic uh, and loss, huge loss and pain, but still magic, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Sarah? I love that naive magic. I'm gonna use that from now on. <laughs> it perfectly describes what we experienced back then. Um, I was, <clears throat> I just started um, doing my master's in film in Edinburgh and um, I hadn't been back to Yemen in a couple of years. And um, just in 2010, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time in Palestine and, um, you know, I, I was um, I was there filming protests and I was like, oh my God, like this energy. And I just wish Yemen had a bit of this, <laughs> you know? So um, when I was back in Scotland and studying film and um, the- This is, the I think, where everything starts. It's Palestine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Palestine starts everything. <laughs> So we had, I had this experience when, um, when I started watching all these uprisings happen across the, the Arab region, where I was both just completely mesmerized by what was happening and, um, and sort of overcome with emotion and, and fascination and just bewilderment. And then also this other side of me was thinking, God, like, this will never happen in Yemen. There's, I, it just, it was so hard to imagine that this would happen. Um, at this point, I'd already booked my flights to Yemen to, to work on um, uh, a university project, um, which is the Mulberry House, which is, I just planned to, to make a film about my family. And um, I'd already told my family, listen, I'm coming with a camera, just be prepared. I'm going to start filming you guys at home and it's going to be completely nothing. It's just, for, it's just for my studies. And I flew back to Yemen the day before the protest started. Um, so I kind of arrived and it was just like, you know, my arrival brought on the revolution, I believe. <laughs> so, you know, it was it was incredible because I, I basically hit the ground running and um, and it kind of all unfolded in front of my eyes. And um, yeah, I guess I was there at the perfect time with a camera. Um, but it was all very, very, you know, the way the whole thing kind of all the events that led up to this moment of me arriving one day before people flocked to the streets. Um, is always very strange for me you know I, I feel like there was some kind of like um orchestration behind the scenes you know like the moment I booked my ticket you know I must have said something was happening so yeah it was a very like I remember the moments that I, I would just sit in bed as a student for hours and hours just watching on Facebook and you know the especially what was happening in Egypt at the time um it was extremely uh, yeah, I, I don't think I can describe it. I can't, I can't describe that feeling of positivity and just this feeling that, yeah, we we are able to do something, the youth, you know. Um, that's my memory of it. I, uh, you brought me a lot of memories back from, from my time in, in Syria. Uh, we like now tend to forget after all the horrible stuff that happened, but uh, they were like, at that time, in that context, really like very happy memory with a lot of uh, hope for change. Uh, but I think to me, it was also empowering, right? Like it, that, that moment, regardless of what happened afterwards, there was a moment of empowerment that I don't think anything afterwards could take it away of watching leaders be afraid. Like I remember that moment of watching Ben Ali Say for him to come, for him to come, right? Like that was fucking fear. Sorry, I'm gonna let swear. <laughs> but like, it, 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 nothing, nothing that can happen afterwards can take away that moment of knowing we as a people can plant fear in our leaders in a way nothing before that 
really translated in that way for me at least right like I know there were uh, in in South Yemen there were uprisings since the 2007 and uh, and then in Iraq there was as well so I'm not saying that there weren't uprisings before that in the Arab world but that moment of see of of leaders seeing us right like it was a contagion in the region that I don't, I don't nobody can take that away from me at least right if you want to call it civil war what's happening right now if you want whatever you want to call it right now in the end for me it's that moment of empowerment where there was a switch where we all saw that saw that moment of empowerment for all of us um and i i, I still think that that was an, an extremely a important moment for us, regardless if uh, it was naive or not. I think uh, I think no leader will forget those moments either. And that, unity. that we can do that to them, you know. Yeah. I think the empowerment and also the unity. I think for yeah. me, the most the, the most the thing that led me to to think or believe that it would never happen in Yemen is the fact that it was so unified. Like it was everybody mm. in the place and and saw it unfold in Yemen. That was I I don't know if it's ever going to happen again in my lifetime. But to have been there and experienced that for yeah. the seconds that it happened, where everybody of every class and every part of the country and uh, tribes and laymen and just everybody just could, you know, yeah. you know, unify, uniting against the common enemy or the common, you know, with a common goal. Oppressor, right? Like I, I, wrote, I drove from Egypt to Libya, which I never thought I would ever see this country in my life as a Saudi. No way would I think it would be allowed, right? And it's like, and I'm like, oh my God, like what a beautiful, and there was no actual border and they had tea because it was winter and cold. And you know, like you're used to being harassed at every air yeah. checkpoint when you cross and they were just giving us tea and like, and I was just like, oh my God, I really, I was with a whole bunch of other journalists, like foreign journalists, and they didn't understand. Like, I just wanted to stand in a corner and cry. Like, this this kind of cross-border unity of people, right? Like, they can have their meetings and they have their Arab League and all that bullshit. But for us, that moment, I agree, Sarah, it, that unified us in ways um, that nothing else, I think, solidified it in the same way. And I feel like that would, despite what has happened since, that moment is a, I think you don't always will get to experience that, that feeling uh, as, I don't know, like I have never felt that feeling in my life and I don't know if I'll feel it again, but that feeling of um, togetherness and, 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 and the possibility of change because, mm. okay, the uprisings happened and maybe there wasn't a clear enough idea for what would happen after the revolution, but like the fact that there was this shared unity of kind of like there is possibility, you know, the possibility of change and this kind of energy, I feel like I have to separate that from all the mess that's happened since because that exists on its own. And um, and, and that gives me faith that, that you know, there is, there is always still possibility, you know, and, uh, and I feel like I have to keep that memory safe, you know, like I can't let it be infected by everything that's happened since. Because, mm. you know, it's an absolute mess, but that moment still happens, you know. It's not but I think also the other. leaderships, our leaderships collectively want yeah. us to forget that moment. They yeah. want us to only remember the chaos, yeah? Yeah, and it's either me or chaos. And that's yeah. exactly how they make us afraid of change. And so it is useful for them, for us to only remember uh, the murders, the disappearances, the dismemberment, the torture, all of that stuff. They want us just to remember that. They want to forget that we had that moment and who was at fault for having that also descend into chaos. But I think these, uh, this period also, it, it paved the way for, the, for, for all sorts of different youth movements and, and cultural collectives and art and all you know the, the the within the arab region now the, the the people who i know within the arts or film network are just you know i know all i know you you too like for from within that network like we we okay. came to find the people who are very similar to us and who were experienced that period and and we are in our in our in in in, in our own way we're kind of like our own culture you know and our own voice and our own and we are you know, I guess through the films that we continue to make and through the, 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 you know, we try and shake things up 
constantly. So I'm like, we're not going to make them. But I think that <laughs> is tangible. Ten years later, like when ten years ago when I went to Yemen, there were no, you know, there were no network film networks, media collectives. There weren't none of this existed. We're individuals scattered around. We kind of coincidentally met in coffee shops where all mm -hmm. of us were individually like editing footage we'd filmed on our, you know, little cameras. And and now there's so much going on, even in, in places like Yemen where there's, you know, where there's war going on and um, Libya and other places. And I, and I find that that gives me a lot of positivity and a lot of energy just to mm -hmm. see. But I think that's also forced people to understand that we can be our own voices. This whole voice of the voiceless, crap that people keep saying right it's like we we always had a voice you just weren't interested in listening mm -hmm. right and and so now the creative process of making these films have also asserted like i was actually on a panel where this woman who had covered the middle east for decades was like oh now uh, we have young uh, female journalists i'm like you always had female journalists in the Arab world. i mean it's like have you never been to lebanon I don't understand what you're talking about, right? <laughs> like it's it was it's such a weird thing, but like now we've become more visible, as if we were newly invented, as if we were landed from a different planet, and now here we are, right? And I, I but I think it's because we've taken up space yeah. a lot more than before, and they they that space needs to. It needs to grow a lot more than what it has, uh, what is now, right? Like, who who knows a filmmaker from Libya and during Gaddafi's time, right? Or from Yemen, except one person, right? <laughs> but like, it's it's like, oh, the one woman from, and it's like, can we stop being the first woman to do something? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, yeah, it's, exceptionalism <laughs> needs to like stop. Yeah. Like, this is like the first woman to do this, the first, yes. like, no, it needs to be like, they are there and they are doing And it's things, rarely true. And, but it's, it's just you know, because they don't know other women. Open, yeah. You know. But that's part of right, Orientalism yeah. and the white gaze and all of yeah. that. It's just like, <laughs> how do we how do we take up a lot more space? So then they can't say, oh, the first woman to do this. Like, no, honey, no, <laughs> we're not the first. There's we have a whole history of this, yeah. right? Uh, but I think part of the problem, at least in in Saudi, is like this erasure, this collective erasure of our history, right? And so it's it's us as Saudis also relearning who who came before us who started protests before us who like all of that is something i, I can't speak to the to, to the rest region that that we are struggling with right because the government doesn't want us to remember these things and so how do we reclaim this like let alone you know the west and their own erasure of us right but we we as a region have had governments and people deliberately erase us as well right and so you you're working on a double erasure <laughs> right on a on a regional level but also on, on on a global level it's like and that's a hard work building on that uh, can you share with us more how did the uprising and their aftermath uh, inspire your filmmakings drawing examples from your work maybe starting with sarah um well, my first two films were were directly <laughs> connected to that. They were about the uprisings. Um, one of them was a short film that focused on an, a, one particular event. And then the other, the second one was a, a, a longer documentary that was a personal um, take on the uprising from within the context of a Yemeni family, which is my family. Um, and ever since then, uh, all of my work has been Yemen related and obviously like connected to the events that have happened since the uprising, um, either through work that I have done with in television or through um, uh, our foundation in Yemen, where we train filmmakers to do independent films and they work on uh, personal stories, they work on, um, uh, yeah, just independent creative films. Um, so, you know, supporting them to do that. And then my own films, which um, which mainly cover the period from the onset of the war in 2015 onwards. Um, uh, three very different films. One is a fiction a fiction film uh, that is you know loose. Well, it is based on a lot of the uh, events that are happening at the moment. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. There's a, a documentary as well that is more um, focused on 
um, current uh, events that are happening, a uh, feature length documentary, char very character driven. And, uh, and the third one uh, is one that I've been working on also since 2015, which is a personal film. Um, that obviously my, my take on the war from my time spent in Yemen in 2015, um, after the war broke out. So it's a lot more reflective. And um, so, yeah, it kind of, the, the whole period from 2011 onwards has, is enmeshed in my work. Like I can't, I keep saying, I need to break away from Yemen. I need to like get, do something different. Let me just go and do like comedy in Amsterdam, you know, but it's just really difficult to not let that influence your work. Obviously it's, 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 it's a massive event that changed our lives. And um, it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I could make a film that isn't connected somehow to that period for, for quite a while, at least until I get these three films out of the way, then maybe I'll try something different. And I wonder, like your family, are they like that you portray in, in the Mulberry House? Are they still in Yemen? Like, because I watched it for the first time recently. I watched like your other movie a long time ago. But that one, because it's very personal, and I was like all the time like thinking about your family, where where they are, how they were affected by the war. Um. Well, in 2018, I um, I went back to Yemen and I got my dad out of Yemen. Um, he's currently now living here in Amsterdam um, with his wife and five of my brothers and sisters. So pretty much any kid that you see in the Mulberry House is now living here in Amsterdam. Um, so obviously that's a direct impact of um, you know of the war on my family and uh, and. Shortly after my dad left Yemen, um, my my grandfather, who's in the film, passed away. So yeah, it's, um, Sorry for it's not, not, not a very happy ending to the whole film, but um, but yeah, it's a happy ending that they're all here now. Thank you. I'm so sorry for your loss. Your grandfather seems uh, from the movie he was like a great man and really very supportive and proud of you. Thank you. Yeah, he was a he was a wonderful man, and it was. Um, yeah, it was a, he, he was quite an old man. He was already in his 90s and he passed away peacefully. And yeah, I think um, like my family are proud of this film. You know, they can watch it now and remember him. And it's, it's very positive. Thank you. Thank you. Safa? Yeah, I would just like to add, he was a sweet, sweet man. Like, he, yeah. Allah Rahman. Uh, you want me to answer the question? Huh. <laughs> I think I, I didn't. Uh, the uprisings are something you can't. Uh, at least for me, there, there's no way I can walk away from it. Right? Like there's. It would be immense. It's it, it's our lives now. It, it, it's our lives in in small and big ways right now. Um, and I can't imagine being interested or being able to do things away uh, from that. Like it is, it is crucial actually that we continue to engage with the ramifications of the uprisings on all of us, um, and uh, uh, continue to question and, uh, uh, and and try to cover it as we evolve our understanding. Uh, of the changes that are happening in the region, right? And it, it, the the film that I made in Saudi was my first and last film uh, in Saudi because I uh, was accused of terrorism afterwards and I was never able to go back home. And so uh, from that moment on, I've been trying to find different ways of continuing to cover what's going on in Saudi in a way that is both honest to my positionality to it now uh, because as any anybody else who's in exile, one is fucking shitty because your understanding of a country stops evolving because you're no longer there to refresh your understanding. And, and especially for me, uh, I mean, the last time I was there was 2014. So the war in Yemen hadn't started yet. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman didn't come to power. King Abdullah was still alive. Like a lot has changed since, since I was last there, right? And so... How, how do I interrogate my, my understanding of my country, be honest about it, be accurate, be, be involved? Like all of these things as, as somebody in exile um, is, uh, is, is really difficult. Like I, 
I'm really envious of people that still can go back and uh, and update their understanding of all of these things, right? Uh, I'm not able to do that. So how do I stay in touch with the realities on the ground uh, despite that? Because that is a major part of my identity. And the other really big part was, uh, for me is Yemen. I've, I've made more films in Yemen than anywhere else in, in the world. And I, I love the country, but because of Saudi, it's become nearly impossible for me to go back to Yemen as well. And so there's like the two places that I consider the most as home are no longer home. And, and so it, it's, and this is why now uh, I, I, I used to do just uh, TV documentaries. So right? now it's like the only way to really interrogate and be more creative in the process of trying to engage with these topics is to do more feature films, right? Because that, that is the place where you can do that, that TV is very limited in your ability to do that. And, and so now I'm struggling to kind of shift the medium uh, to, to be able to, to be more honest about my abilities and lack thereof in, uh, in engaging with, with these places and and how to be more creative about it. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, yeah, it's something I struggle with a lot, especially in the past two years when my ability to go back into Yemen uh, has been uh, severely curtailed. Um, and that to me, like Yemen is not just Yemen, uh, but Yemen is Saudi as well, as in we are, we are waging war in a country, we've decimated that country. And very few people in, in Saudi actually understand what is going on, or even understand Yemen, like the audacity of it. Um, it it's frightening to me. I don't understand how we got to this point where we are so disconnected uh, from the devastation of a country near us. And, and so and be so blasé in explaining that devastation as well. Um, and, and so for me, it's, um, I live it every day. There's no, there's no way to, to think of, uh, of something else. Like uh, to me, it's unethical to think of something else, right? Like it is our responsibility to, uh, uh, to constantly try to to find ways of, do, of telling those stories. Nasiha? Yeah, um, I suppose I was uh, listening to both Safa and Farah, like this thing of um, the p positionality of it and the not being able to be untwined from, from this moment in time. And I think all three of us are, are maybe um, between uh, places because uh, you know we're not in the places always, or are between cultures. Or and I think there's um, I, I talk about this naivety, this this kind of naive magic. And that moment, you know, that was very inspiring because I was connecting to all these young filmmakers who hadn't made films before or like hadn't made them, you know, publicly before, just made them secretly. And it was a very exciting moment. And and so you know that was a big catalyst like for 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 my filmmaking I before that I'd worked in the theater and I I wanted to you know before this trip to Libya I'd, I was doing storytelling but in other ways and I think going to Libya was really this like there felt an urgency of like being this person who is in a between space to um to I mean that's a privilege you know like I I I have a privilege, I have a privilege of movement that a lot of the, um, you know, my, my family members who are there don't have. I have a privilege of um, access. And, and I felt like I, even when like the war was happening in 2014, like the, the, the airport war, we call it, and then the subsequent assassinations that were happening and when people were leaving, like you feel this kind of like, even more so I cannot leave. Like I cannot leave because I, again, have this, privilege and this positionality and in some ways that's given yourself too much importance because actually people are you know already communicating and they are getting things out but when you have two passports and you have freedom of movement um, in ways that other people don't or like I don't know so I just um, I think my my filmmaking was in like wasn't just inspired by this was like a catalyst for my filmmaking and the uprising but my that naiveness then kind of left me a little and it became more of a like a 
I don't know, like the women in um, Freedom Fields, for example. So I I've, I've filmed them over five years and um, they're from so many different um, backgrounds and, you know, different classes, different ethnic backgrounds, different tribes. Um, but they all come together for this kind of one dream to play football. But it's not really about football. It's about kind of carving a space for yourself within the public sphere, within society. And like, for me, it just felt absolutely like, vital that the story was told but but because they were so passionate and so like like some people say well football's not important in this moment but for them it was like football is exactly like important in this moment not because it's football but because if we say culture comes after we solve the things or you know sport comes after we solve the things then we're we're not really solving the things so for them it was I'm rambling but I suppose the point being is that this um this not being able to leave or that, that, that this, this being tied into your work. And after that film came out, um, I thought I was working on another film that had been working on simultaneously at the same time about um, a brother and sister who fought on opposite sides of the Libyan uprising. Um, and I had shot on that film, but I was also producing. And so I was like, okay, I'll finish that film. Maybe I'll try something else that's not linked to Libya. But I actually, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like it's, it's something that I, I am uh, tied to. Um, and I feel like, well, maybe I need to try doing something else to see if I can, but I'm like, but I don't actually have that same passion to. And I think when you make particularly long form documentaries, like they are hard, they are so hard. And um, uh, not only on the ground, but the production side of things. And you have to have that absolute like bonded passion. Otherwise you just won't, bother continuing and finalizing and finishing and um so I feel I don't know I, I yeah it's I, I feel my filmmaking and, and and Libya is is entwined and um and there are so many amazing people now making films in Libya and there is a, an amazing kind of um group of young people who are, are doing things and there were people before in under the Gaddafi era that were doing things but very quietly and there are these old dudes so for them it's a little bit like hey we've always been here we were just here quietly and then you know there's the young younger people coming through and uh, finding ways that those can come together I think is important um uh yeah we recently did a at JCC in Tunis there was um a kind of a focus on Libya films and that was really I think interesting for Tunisians who are right next door to Libya um, and where a lot of people seek refuge um, in Tunis and there are a lot of Libyans in Tunis and so you know but they still don't know that much about Libyans so for them it was really interesting to and they're the neighbor you know and it was similar to what you were saying about Yemen and, and Saudi it's not a, a, a similar thing as in, in case of war but it is a similar thing in case of um, you know uh, there is such a, a, a clash because you know Libyans come with a certain way and Tunisians are there with another way and so to, to communicate through film and, and to, to know each other in a different way than just this exchange that, that has previously happened I think is important um, but yeah so I think I yeah it, it will continue to be a bond and but I and I'm I, I yeah yeah anyway <laughs> Uh, Safa talked a little bit about uh, some of the challenges of speaking truth to power, and all of you speak truth to power. Uh, can you share with us some of the challenges that you faced uh, by telling complex stories like the ones you're working on? It might be like while you are, are filming or in the a production and promotion stage or seeking funding for your work? Uh... Um, shall I answer or, you, or did you specifically ask Safa? So, no, I'm asking yeah. all of you, so you're welcome, yes. <laughs> I'm building on Safa because she talked a little bit about how Saudi Arabia announced her terrorist uh, doesn't like have access to Saudi Arabia currently and Yemen. Yeah. But uh, I'm wondering about other challenges in production, in promotion, in visibility internationally. Um, I think it's interesting working on a film about Yemen because on one hand, there's a thirst for, story, for stories that talk about what's going on in Yemen. Um, 
you know, so, so on one hand, you kind of have to push away like the, the vampires, because there's a lot of them out there who are just like, we want a film about Yemen, great, you know, let's get in there. Um, with sometimes not, not very good intentions or sometimes um, trying to over influence the narrative or, um, but on the other hand, it's also a very delicate subject. So then there's a lot of sometimes reservation um, with regards to people who are putting money into the project because you know they have might have connections to Saudi or they might have connections to the USA and if the film is, is in any way talking about um, one side or the other like within the Yemen context it's also a very complex situation because you're also you're not only talking about the Saudi war in Yemen you're also talking about the civil war inside Yemen and which story are you trying to tell so from in my in, in you know, my view experiencing all the different stages of it now, post uh, uprising, like during the revolution, it was different because there was kind of a, it was kind of one obvious narrative. It's like the people versus dictatorship, a, a dictator and, you know, good versus bad. That was it, you know, and it was kind of, you can, you can quite easily um, contain the story and you you know you will get support for it because at that period especially 2011 2012 I think film festivals were just oversaturated with revolution films um, which was which was wonderful but um, the period that came afterwards where you know countries became torn apart pulled, there was a lot of polarization and civil wars erupted and it became so much harder then to tell a story without people saying oh well you're telling that side of the story therefore you are you belong to this party or um, so I think as a Yemeni trying to tell a story that, you know, where I want to shed light on specific things that are happening within the country, I'm also treading carefully because, you know, I know that there's, there's going to be the Yemeni perspective um, where nobody's going to agree with it and it's going to be torn to shreds. And then you have the international perspective where, you know, certain things are expected to be said about the war in Yemen. And then, so it's really like, it's so much more complicated making a film about Yemen now than it was in 2011. Hence why it's also taken me like five years to write a screenplay. Um, so, and then during the production, you know, there's other reservations. And then there's, you know, there's, there's concerns also, for example, this is a hypothetical situation. It's not necessarily happened to me, but in a situation where you have a, a platform that uh, buys your film and that film might have Saudi money in it and they might just decide to like shelf your film. So after five or six years of working on a project, there, there is also that risk that whoever might buy your film, if they are, for example, you a US company or a Saudi company, or have Saudi or, uh, funding or, or, or US funding or UK funding, they might decide that this is a film that they don't want the, the world to see and therefore, you know, they'll, 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 they'll make sure that it doesn't see the light of day. Um, so these are all the challenges that I think or I feel that I have to, you know, with my, my teams, we have to constantly discuss and talk about how to either mitigate or try to ignore and just do what we're doing and not really care about the backlash that's going to happen afterwards but then there's also like security risks what's going to happen if you want to go back to Yemen after the after films are released um how's the public going to take it how are people on the outside going to take it am I going to be able to travel back to Yemen like Safa yeah I mean, there's you know there's all this all of these concerns that go into you know okay I want to speak truth to power and I want to tell these this this version of what is going on that nobody really knows about or you know, sometimes it's subtleties within the culture itself, and sometimes it's, you know, criticizing Yemenis themselves and the culture itself for certain things that are happening. And then there's this guilt situation of like, ah, who am I to like, you know, focus on these issues that might not reflect well on the country as a whole. And so it's, it's a constant like battle, I think. And just, you know, I just hope that eventually these films will come out. And, um, you know, I, I will have done them justice, but yeah, it's, it's a it's a massive challenge, I think, in this climate to be, you know, to be to be making films about a country that is still in war. It's different if it were ten years later, and then it could be reflective. It's still ongoing, and the threats are still ongoing and very much alive. And um, yeah, so it's a it's a constant struggle. Naziha, do you want to add? Yeah, I mean um, the. The complexities of that. Um, I suppose I would definitely um, second with Sarah that thing of um, making things that are are nuanced or that um, because I think you know you come back to who you're making films for, but also 
I, I want to make films that reach multiple different, you know, um, layers of society and different demographics and different, you know, sorts of people, but that the things have to be then layered and, and, and I think and making things nuanced and, 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 and complicated and complex. And, and I think often if you have a commissioning editor on board or you have like, I don't know, uh, an exec on board or something, and it's, um, you want the people around your film to be also protecting that nuance and not wanting to oversimplify because I think there's this thirst in, in, in the West particularly to, to oversimplify, to make it digestible for their audiences, even though audiences can definitely manage complex. I think, you know, there's this oversimplification that people worry about. And um, so for, for, I'd say on that side of things, um, it's always trying to protect the, 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 the nuance of the film, the complexity of it, and making sure that that's not stripped away because um, I, I don't want my films to be simple because I don't, I don't think life is simple. I don't think the, you know, for example, Libya is not simple. You know, Libyans on the ground don't know what's going on in their own country. Just as we don't know what's going on in our own country if I'm here in the UK or like, but for some reason that's not expected of films from the West. Whereas films from the, you know, uh, let's say the, the, the countries that we're making films in, um, people want things simplified. And it's like, so why is that expected from films from there, but not from films from there, from there? So for me, it's really important to continually make sure that this oversimplification is not, um, doesn't happen. Uh, I would say challenges on the ground, I think is, I mean, there are multiple, I think to do with, uh, protecting, um, working in a way that's responsible um, is a big challenge. That's not, um, uh, it's not filmmaking as extraction because I think that's really problematic. So making sure that the, the films you make are for the people from, you know, that are in them, but is also protecting them too. So for example, with Freedom Fields, we, the film was used by the women in, in the film who set up their own NGO and they use the film for their, their, their workshops on the ground in Libya but and they're happy to be in the film but for example they're not in any of the the posters they're not in the trailer um they're not in the stills that go out because for them their the, the the attacks that happen to them would often happen on social media so they're happy to be in something that's you know in a cinema or in a a, a screening space um but not on social media so you know, working with them on the release of the film, of what they want, not just what um, a sales agent wants or what a commissioning ed editor wants. And, and, and that takes, um, I think, you, you have to push people to, tr to, to allow to, be, to do things differently. Um, and I will always push for that because I just think um, it's not just, the films you make are not just your films, they're, they're, they belong to the people who are in them as well. And I think they, you know, for me, having the women in Freedom Fields, for example, really involved in, in, in the kind of the release of the film was, was really important. Um, but it's a challenge to, to kind of fight for those things. Um, because at the end of the day, I want the film to have an impact with the things that they want to change, like changing the education system in Libya or changing the way in which girls have access to space or um, the way in which people deal with trauma. So they often use you know, sport as a, a vehicle for kind of trauma release and a reconciliation. And if the film interrupted that work, it would not be doing what they set out to do in the first place. So, yeah, so all of these are multiple challenges that kind of intermesh. Um, and and I, th I think just staying true to those, those sorts of ideals when you have, you know, money, people pressuring you or you have, um, you know, commissioning editors or, or whatever. Um, yeah, and holding true to that, I think, is really, really important. Um, yeah. Sorry, I went on a bit there. Afat, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I would say it took me two years to find a commissioner uh, to commission the Saudi film, although I thought it was a no-brainer. <laughs> like, why would you not want a documentary about uh, an, a historic uprising in uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, everybody everybody wanted a film about women driving in Saudi Arabia. Everybody wanted the stupidest shit about the royal family. Everybody wanted really obvious, cliche, stereotypical uh, stories of what is 
Saudi Arabia, right? Nobody wanted something that challenged the perceptions of what is a Saudi, who is a Saudi, what defines a Saudi. Um, and, and so it is, uh, it is the opposite of my experience of getting commissioned on anything on Yemen. Uh, yeah, that is right. And that way, it was more of being careful about what kind of commission you take, right? With Saudi, if it didn't fit into really tight, uh, uh, narrow frames of their understanding of Saudi, it, they, weren't, uh, they weren't interested. Um, and uh, to add to that, uh, even now, similar to what's uh, going on in Yemen, I have very few options of who I can get commissioned by. And when it comes to television channels, for me, it is very important to produce films in Arabic for the people I filmed with, right? And uh, to me, that's a no-brainer. This is an obvious thing, uh, but uh, I don't need to name who are the channels that produce in Arabic and who owns them and who controls the narrative and editorial policy of those channels, right? So who am I gonna produce something on Saudi for, right? If it's Jazeera, I'm dead in the water. If it's an Arabi, I'm dead in the water. Like there's no way for me to produce things from the region, in the region, without having an implicit bias, regardless of the content of the film itself, right? And so there are very few people that do broadcast in Arabic. And, though, and those who are not based in the Middle East are based in Europe and they have their own problems because it's the white gaze. Even if they're Arab commissioners, they are commissioning with uh, the thought in their heads of uh, what will work with the Western audience because that is more important, right? And uh, because it's, uh, it's based in London or it's based in uh, Germany or France, right? Like there's, there was such a, constrained about how you, it, it's not a, a film by Safa, so Safa is fully expressed in this film and it represents everything about me. It's, it's far from it. It's like pulling teeth uh, in the editorial process and the framing and the storytelling and the contextualizing and the problematizing and the, and the adding that complexity to the story, right? Because it's like, I mean, the beauty is in the details of things, right? Why would you make it more simple? It's a, or like, I, I had to have a conversation where they're like, you have to explain what is a Shi'i and what is a Sunni. I'm like, no way, no way. This is not, <laughs> this is not the film, right? But for them, it's so basic, right? And so everything has to be explained. So for an Arab audience, you're like, oh, so you're not making this for us. Right. As soon as you start explaining badihiyat al haya, right, <laughs> then then you 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 become a foreigner yourself. You 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 self orientalization or something like the film is like did did a Saudi do this? Like why why is she explaining this stuff? Right. Like it's and and that is so hard for me. So it was just like from the get go of who commissions it to who broadcasts it and where and how it gets framed and all of that. And what, I mean, it, 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 there are challenges all the way through, let alone the, the, the security challenges. And I agree with both Naziha and Saura on all the levels of like the security on the ground. But for example, I was filming in Saudi and by the time I got to the edit, uh, the terrorism laws changed in Saudi. So my main character, couldn't be my main character anymore. I had to cut him out, like completely cut him out. I had to restructure the entire film, right? It was like, okay, either he gets executed or I don't have a film. And so it was all of a sudden this like juggle in the, uh, in the edit. It was like, okay, what kind of film can I make with this? And it turned into something not what I had filmed when I was on the ground. And, and all of these things, I, I think, it, 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 people who are from the region who make these films have an added emotional and moral burden uh, that people who will fly in, who uh, fly out and they don't think of what are the ramifications for the people on the ground. And I have countless examples of that, people who flow to, if flow, yani, who will fly into Yemen or into Saudi. And they, and they have zero interest in what the ramifications are of what happens to, to the people in the film after after they leave but my intent is fully I, I one don't want to endanger anyone in the film but also I want to go back in and I want I don't want to be ashamed to say this is the film that I made please watch it right and uh, it is really really difficult because that's an added burden for me at least which I find it's more traumatizing for me to be in the edit 
than to be in the field. Like people are like, oh, so it's so dangerous. I'm not like, no, no, that is great. I have no problem with that. It's when I sit in the edit and my exec comes and he says, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And we're fighting over like frames and a word here, or there, of like what you need to explain. Like that to me, of like, I've carried these people's stories and traumas and now I'm responsible, right? And then these people come and they slash it. And I'm like, oh my God, like, I'm, I'm sure I'm not, I'm not married to work with. <laughs> like, you, you carry these burdens with you, right? Like, did you fulfill what you promised people on the ground or not? And for feature films, I, yeah, I mean, I haven't done one yet, but this is my illusion or, or my hope that <laughs> is a kinder process than with television, right? Because with television, it's just a lot more cutthroat about the policy and the editorial policy of what ends up being in the film and what isn't and reality of how long the film can be and all of these things and what fits into a sequence. And, and, and so I, I would say from, from A to Z, making a film ethically uh, without losing your mind in the process, right? Is, is actually quite a thing. This is why it takes, I mean, I'm amazed when foreigners just come in and out and they make like 10 films a year. I was like, how is this possible? How do you do this? <laughs> You're like, it's, it, to me, it's impossible. Like one a year and the headspace for me, as Nadia as, as was saying, it's like, it really takes a lot to go through that process. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I think it's it's like it's just the challenge of constantly being the guard, right? Like, no, white gaze, stay away. This is you're not doing this to my film, right? And you, you become super protective of it, but also they're not the ones who are going to pay uh, for mistakes in the film. Or what I think are mistakes. I pay the mistakes of my. Film. I'm the one who's banned from my country. I'm the one who can't go to Yemen. It's not my executive producer or a production company or whatever, they don't pay a price for any of this. I do, right? Yet they get to make final calls on, on how things are done, right? I'm, I'm exaggerating a little, but like the, the, the added emotional burden as a filmmaker from the region when we make these films, uh, I, I, I think is huge if you're gonna do it ethically, right? And you're bound to make mistakes, but like to, to go through that process with that awareness of, uh, of even what Sara was saying, of like, what can you say now? What is this moment, right? Uh, can I be critical of the misogyny, of the patriarchy, being honest about what it means to work as a woman there, right? I'm constantly saying it's my superpower. It gives me a lot more space and room and I get access to things and then don't. All true, right? But there are other challenges as well in it, right? when is the appropriate time to talk about these things? Where is the appropriate platform to talk about these things, right? Because you are already fighting the white gaze, right? <laughs> you, you are already fighting the orientalization. You're already fighting to get complex stories about it, it, the country that you are, uh, that you're working on and you want to work against the stereotypes, but some of them, so it really, I, I find that, you know, we have so many more things to deal with than anyone else who's not from the region doesn't deal with or doesn't even think about. I'd say on top of that as well is the, the thing of like, um, you know, for example, the Ministry of Culture or whatever in Libya being like, why do you, why, why do you want to give, you know, people haven't heard anything about Libya and now you want to give them this, you know, like this, like, you know, you chose to do this. And it's kind of this thing of, you know, you, you want to represent the country, but you also don't. Like, I, I want to represent the films that I make and the stories that I'm telling. I don't represent a country, you know? And I think it's being between the, the, the white gaze thing that you spoke about, but also being between the, the being a representative of, of a country. And you're like- Which is unfair, right? Which is unfair, because, because, because if somebody is film. making a film in Germany, they're not a representative of Germany. They're just and a filmmaker no who happens to be German, you know? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. and then he's like, they can do whatever they want, right? And I'm thinking, it's like, this is going to be the only film on Saudi Arabia for another five years. What am I going to say? <laughs> no, like, like, what is your priority in life at this moment for the next five years? I'm like, who thinks like that besides us? Like, it's so, it's such a so, huge burden. It's just such a huge pressure, and and also you're thinking, like you said, like if this is the only film that comes out of Yemen or out of Saudi in five years. There is the pressure coming from the outside where you, you obviously it's not like you want to serve their, you know, their 
thirst for a specific image or you want to, you know, um, pay lip service to that, but you're trying to counter a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of stereotypes. Where do you begin? Yeah. Where do you begin? <laughs> and then at the same time, there are some of those stereotypes that are just part of daily life. Like, you know, they are also there, but you kind of want to tread carefully and not, you know, not, you know, not, not focus on that too much because then it might upset too many people. And then, so you're, it's just a constant, you're a constant juggling act. And, mm -hmm. um, and in the process of trying to do an ethical film where you control the narrative, you're also doing this broke. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you, yeah. We are, you're oh, we're all millionaires, okay? We'll all have oil. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make any money. And it takes us years and years and years. And we're just, you know, again, very aware that whatever we're going to make is going to be something that is extremely controversial. Somebody asked a question, actually, I just saw the questions right now from the audience. Um, uh, just you know talking about controversial um, films and uh, controversial stories and upsetting you know people not want you know not wanting a specific image to be portrayed about it like you said there is still patriarchy there's still, there is misogyny there is a lot of crap that goes on anywhere else in the world that goes on in, in our countries too but if you you know one side you don't want to fuel the fire and 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 kind of um, and encourage those stereotypes and those images, but sometimes they are part, really a massive part of a problem. And there is this, this constant internal struggle of, am I now orientalizing? Am I making this problem? Am I, am I, you know, am I har harming the narrative of Yemen because I've mentioned this, or I showed a woman wearing a niqab or a man chewing khat or somebody holding a, a gun. I'm trying to like omit this stuff from, from my film, but at the same time, that's not, it's also not the reality, but there is this massive pressure that, you know, it's our, it's our choice. We decided to become filmmakers in countries that have, <laughs> that are very complex, but, um, and as women as well, on top of all of it. Um, but yeah, it is something that I think can really thwart the creative process and really, you know, just the constant negotiations at every level, on a creative level, on a, an ideological level, on an existential level, you're just constantly negotiating boundaries and, and what will work and, and, and really trying to keep that, you know, the, the original essence of the story that you wanted to tell and stay true to the people who are in it without also letting the people, if it's a documentary film, for example, like Naziha was saying, you want them to be part of it, but also sometimes that can go against the film because like halfway through they're like oh don't want to be part of the film anymore politics have changed i'm gonna get shot or sometimes it's just as simple as somebody a woman showed her face in the film and her husband decided after she'd signed a release form that he's going to divorce her if her film her face is going to be screened on, on public television you know so there's also these things like you know when you're trying to like keep people involved uh, in terms of your contributors or your characters then there's also that complexity of trying to just Tell the stories that you want to tell without it being so damn hard <laughs> every step of the way. So that's somebody says, how do you navigate that? I don't know. We just like on a daily, it's the daily grind trying to dodge bullets and like say the right thing. And yeah, I'm podcasting now. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, no more worrying about women and their faces or uh, keeping, keeping someone anonymous, but like it is, it is so hard. It is really, it's not easy at all. But yet we still do it. I love it. I mean, I, yeah, I can't exactly. imagine doing something else, but, <laughs> but like maybe. Is that to bring us actually to something that I wanted to ask you about? Because as you mentioned, your films deal with a lot of trauma, right? Like shows communities, how they survive trauma but also i wanted to ask like how you survive like how what what like coping mechanism you develop throughout the years to also like um uh, survive direct traumas yeah, that you might encountered or also second-hand trauma by telling uh, the experiences of people in context of violence Who wants to take that? <laughs> Maybe Nazi, how you want to start? <laughs> I think, I don't know. I think this, there's many layers of this and I, I haven't figured it out yet how you, you do that. 
but um, fully. But I think one of the things comes back to your, another question of, of yours, Cassie, was about the joy. Um, yeah. I think that even in absolute despair, um, if you can still find these moments of joy, like that's really important. Like even like coming back to freedom feels like it opens on somebody eating an ice cream. Like this is, you know, I'm not opening on a revolution. I refuse to re open on cards that tell you what the uprising was or whatever, like that's for Google. But like I'm opening on an ice cream because this is how we survive. And this is how we um, manage trauma is not an ice cream, but you know, finding those small moments and, and keeping those sacred. I think the, 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 the other part, well, there's many other parts, but like, I think the edit is, a, I find a very uh, traumatic experience. Um, I find it a very violent experience coming back to what you were saying earlier. I feel like you're literally cutting up somebody's life. Like, you know, you are cutting on a timeline and that is someone's life and you are, um, so there, and there's such responsibility in that and there is a, a weight. Um, so I find that quite traumatic and maybe also, knowing that that's traumatic for an editor as well, who has secondary trauma, maybe they haven't been on the ground, so they don't have the context of being on the ground. So therefore managing that trauma is, is, is also different for them. I, I personally believe that budgets should have, you know, you know uh, therapy lines built in for protagonists, also for filmmakers, for the editors. Um, I feel like there should be, um, when a film comes out, you should have a session or more than a session but with the protagonist so that's their life is going to change forever and nobody prepares enough I think for that um how do you prepare for that you know you, and so I think trying to get closer to these ideals that I would like knowing even though that we don't have the full budget for those things I think is really important to still to strive for that um personally I, I just have to walk walking is my walking and swimming is my like couldn't do that much in Libya but still I was like I'm going for a walk <laughs> like um or me you know we'd get up very early in the morning and go for a swim um uh and I think s sometimes having some distance occasionally is very important even if when you're in the midst of it um because otherwise you stop being able to see and 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 you and, and you become desensitized to your your experience and then violence and trauma and war becomes your normal and that's not i think as people who tell stories i think that's why those people can fly into lots of different places and make a million films because they've become desensitized um and i think that doesn't make good filmmaking so i don't i don't want to be desensitized but i also don't want to live in the trauma all the time so it's making sure that that for the people you work with for the people that are in your films that that, that balance is constantly trying to be um uh yeah finding some e equilibrium with that um yeah and ice cream that's i don't know figuring it all out food is definitely my cool thing again yeah. i have to admit <laughs> Food and pop culture, like one, I just yeah. like one. This, this Food, absolutely. <laughs> like when we've been out on a shoot, we have to come back and we eat together, you know, and we we think about what we've just experienced together and we eat or like eating with the people in the films. That's really important for me. Like, I just feel like food is such a way to understand each other and to have a bit of respite even from what we're all doing, you know, to decompress and yeah, anyway. Maybe I should write a cookbook. It'll make Sarah, a do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, I mean, it's been ups and downs, obviously, for over ten years. But um, I mean, in the beginning, I was. I guess as a as a filmmaker who was new to it and and I jumped right in the deep end with really, really violent stuff. And my first film was about a massacre and it was extremely brutal. And I edited it myself in in my university. I had no editor working with me on the film. I um, I lived with the footage of that massacre. And like Nazi has said, it's such a responsibility to edit a, an entire day's event where hundreds of people were affected and over 50 people were killed and they were, they were it was so violent to try and do the, that moment justice and tell the stories but again the pain that came with omitting things or cutting things and selecting the footage and 
going through over 30 hours of very, very brutal, um, violent image imagery on my own um, for about two months was soul destroying. And, you know, it, it took, it, there were lots of ups and downs. There was a lot of, um, luckily at the time I, I was a full-time yoga teacher while I was at university. So that also helped me kind of switch off from like a night in the edit room. And I would just go into a yoga studio and just like pretend this to be very Zen and <laughs> like teach, lead people through like a one and a half hour yoga class. And that for me, it was like, you know, fake it till you make it. I kind of faked being calm and collected and while I was in the process of teaching that actually it did ground me a lot and it did kind of let me kind of um shut off of all of the stuff that I was witnessing and watching and it helped a lot and and actually I just um I continued doing that throughout until 2017 or so um where even even when I was you know during the the war in Yemen when I came back from that and I lived in Egypt for for about nine months after um experiencing six months of really intense bombing and you know and filming during the war in Yemen um I just I switched off I put my footage aside I didn't touch my footage I didn't want anything to do with filmmaking and I just turned my attention to teaching yoga I was pregnant at the time so I just spent you know my entire pregnancy teaching yoga and that was it that was the only way I could really deal with it and then come back to my footage with a fresh eye and be I mean we're human obviously we're going to get affected and that's going to affect the way that we work and the stories that we tell and uh, like Nazi has said, if you don't want to be desensitized or completely traumatized that you're crippled and you can't really continue doing what you're doing. Um, and, and having that kind of awareness of how impactful it is either first firsthand a trauma or second, you know, through through editing, um, like it's really important for us uh, in, my, in our film foundation in Yemen called Gumra, we have um, we actually organize uh, with the trainees that we train, um, you know, if, if we have uh, two, two parts, we have a training, um, academy, and then we also have a production company. So some of the filmmakers, they go and they actually film really tragic stuff, like human rights violations and, and really, really, um, difficult stories. And then also the trainees themselves, they have, like, even if they haven't filmed anything, they themselves have experienced living the past seven years in war. Um, so it's very important for us to give therapy. So usually we 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 ask donors who who support our pro programs to to contribute a portion of our of their budget towards to us um, towards you know psychological help. So we do um, we do like uh, a, a weekly um, therapy group therapy session with with um, with a, with a qualified therapist um, in Arabic, and then. Um, and then we select a few, like sometimes we have some cases of film, film filmmakers within our network who are really, really um, struggling. Uh, they've either experienced something very recently. And of course now with COVID, it's just it's become even more um, challenging for filmmakers on the ground because people have, you know, constantly like relatives dying with no vaccines and so on. Um, so we've made it, you know, we then select a few who have one-on-one -on -one psychological um, uh, uh, counseling with with a therapist or um, psychologist. Um, so I think that's just one way that we try to, to 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 do that, and also the support network. Like we've created a network of filmmakers who, you know, we kind of have our own little community in Sanaa, and um, and this, I'm more connected to them than I am to anybody in Amsterdam where I live right now. Um, I'm I'm in constant communication with them. Um, and we deal with these struggles together. And I think it's really important to talk about them and, and to constantly let them understand that they have an outlet, that it's not, you know, they're not alone in it and that they can get the support that they need. But it's also really difficult for the ones who are still inside the, the situation for, for those of us who have the, the privilege and the opportunity to leave, like we then experience post-traumatic stress disorder because we were in it and now we're out. And then we have the space to reflect and feel and go through the motions. But for a lot of them who are still living in that situation, there is, is, is a continuum, you know, it's, it's just one trauma on top of another on top of another. And then they become so disconnected from what trauma actually means. They just believe that this is this is just life. And sometimes they seem way more resilient than they actually are. But it's just a, a sort of numbing that's happened over the course of, you know, the years of just enduring extreme and extreme stress and um, and trauma. Safa. Actually, yoga was also my coping mechanism when I came from Syria to the US and when Trump 
uh, one because <laughs> it was like That's another trauma. <laughs> It was like trauma after a trauma. We cannot like have, like for our communities, I feel we cannot like have a break. But so far, do you want uh, to add anything? Well, I am uh, much older than Nazia and Abi and, uh, and Sara. Um, so I used to live in Palestine in the second Intifada. And in that to me was, like when you were you're in it right uh yeah i was uh, in a refugee camp in bethlehem and the intensity of of all of that was was something but i must say with all the stuff that i've covered uh, covering my own country feels different right there's i'm not saying that it's more or less from um it, it, in the value of stories, I'm not saying that. It's just it hits you in a different way, and it, it, it hits you in a way that you, you. At least for me, I wasn't prepared for, it, right? Like I thought it would be like all the other places that I've covered, um, and I've been doing this for like what 20 years now. I, I only recently have I understood how trauma works, and uh, and sometimes you have you have anchors, right? And uh, th those anchors really help you. Like even if you went through something really, really traumatic, your anchors keep you stable, right? And sometimes you don't realize it's an anchor until you lose it. Um, and so in, 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 the, in the past few years, uh, I've, I've realized how collectively our anchors uh, have been weakened, right? Living in exile is something that you cannot prepare for. And so as Sara was saying, yes, it's PTSD, but also at least for the Saudi community that has had to uh, leave Saudi, we are not in concentrations, right? We're a few in different places. So that, that support network, that, uh, that sense of community is a lot harder because we've come out of a place that made us so suspicious of each other. So, and as you were saying in the beginning, you started seeking out other Libyans, right? Like it, it's so new, it's the same with Saudis, right? But even with that, it comes with a lot of suspicion, especially now, it's like, especially after Jamal and stuff. You, you, like you don't know who, who you can and cannot trust and all these things. And I, I feel like that's, um, that's eroded a lot of your, uh, at least my ability to recover from trauma, right? Like that, though, and especially like with COVID, it just do like you're in double isolation. You're in isolation as like with Amsterdam, right? Like you're here, but you're not. You're constantly thinking of somewhere else. Your head is in Sana'a, ah, my head is in, in Aden, my head is in, uh, like you, you're constantly living in other places. You're, you're never able to root yourself where you are, which also increases that or, or doesn't help you recover from trauma, right? Because you're never really present where you are. And uh, at least for me, it's like I had to I convince myself it's not uh, a betrayal to others, the survival's guilt of being able to get out, being able to have easy access to, to food, to not worry about being bombed. And like all of these things that you leave behind, it's such a privilege. We live such a privilege. And yeah, that I think in a way causes trauma as well, that privilege that we come with, those passports that allow us to get on, on a plane and get out. Um, and so it, for some reason, it's a lot worse now for me than it was before. Like those anchors collectively, I think somehow uh, uh, are, are not as resilient. We're, and I think it's okay now not to be resilient, right? It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to feel raw and to publicly say, I'm not okay. Like this is, none of this is okay. And if you are okay, then you're not normal. <laughs> like you're on a way to be a sociopath if you think this is normal, right? And, but it's a struggle to say, how do you stay healthy? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how you sit in it. I don't know how you sit with this material and think about these things and the possibilities of being kidnapped and killed and chopped in a, in a counselor. Like, how do, you, how do you process this as a real possibility in your life and still, and still go about your daily life, right? I'm not doing it. <laughs> I don't know how other people are doing it, but it's. Uh, I'm. I'm glad now it's okay to talk about it. 
before like even 10 years ago it wasn't okay to talk about it you would worry that you wouldn't get a commission because you would say i'm not really feeling okay after this assignment right now it's kind of better they pay more lip service to it uh some people are more genuine than others about it uh but what is the, the true responsibility of people who commission and stuff i i don't know i i think I, I don't think enough is being done to understand that, right? And especially the editing process. They think it's only when you're on, in the field that that's the traumatic bit. To me, dealing with uh, the editing is where the trauma begins, actually. It's when you feel like you're dealing with people that have no respect uh, for the material that you've brought. They have no respect for what you experience, um, how the gaslighting, the fact-checking, <laughs> You know, did this really happen? What did they really mean? Understanding trauma, like my last film in Yemen, I've never experienced, you could visibly see like this woman who saw her, her, uh, her, her young son like blown by a missile, right? And she couldn't even remember how many kids she had. Like she couldn't remember like basic things. Uh, and I'm like, and, and the guy was like, she must be lying. I'm like, dude, she's traumatized. It's not the same thing. Like understand what trauma looks like, right? And, and so having to deal with this kind of uh, editing process where it, it's masquerading as fact-checking, but it is actually really disrespectful of people's trauma. It's somehow like white people are allowed to have trauma, but people in war zones are not allowed. It, like the conversations about refugees and when they go to Europe, it's like, why are they behaving so? Dude, they just survived the war and you want them to walk away and walk away from it like normal human beings. Of course they have trauma, like understand that. Like, I don't feel we are allowed to have that, right? And you have to struggle to get to that point where uh, people don't look at you um, as a confirmation of a stereotype rather than this is what trauma looks like. We have uh, nine minutes left, and I want uh, to give some space to our uh, audience. So there are some uh, questions in the chat, uh, including if you ever thought about doing films not in the country that uh, you did your films in, but like about Arab community, maybe in Europe where you live, or uh, if you consider doing. Uh, films uh, uh, based on novels by Arab Americans or Arab uh, kind of like Arab Western uh, novelist. Are you interested in this type of, of work? Um, I'm interested in making a, a, com a comedy sitcom uh, about Yemeni refugees arriving in Amsterdam. The stories that I come across on a daily basis of the stuff that happens is, I mean, it's extremely funny. And um, my husband and I had decided at one point, just from hearing all of these stories from my relatives and from friends and just through the grapevine of, of very, very funny incidents that happen where um, just the, the, whole, the whole process of integrating into a country like Holland you know, as a Yemeni and the way that Yemenis come with such, you know, enthusiasm for, for, you know, for the greenery and for the, you know, the openness and the freedoms and everything and, and going into supermarkets where everything is there and, and come, especially coming from a really kind of um, horrendous situation in, in, in uh, during the war, um, where then they get some money from the Dutch government when they're placed in a house and they suddenly decide that it's really, really important to spend all of that money on a fridge the size of a car. And then that, and then that refrigerator cannot enter the door of the building because it's just way too big, but they never thought to measure the size of the door. And, you know, there's just like incidents like this on a daily basis where I just think, ah, oh, this is material for pure comedy where we're kind of looking at the post-war period where people have now, you know, they now have new lives in a new country and, they have to somehow navigate the culture clash and, you know, assimilate into some new world that they have no connection to, a new language, a new everything. Um, so this is one of my dreams is to actually do something funny, but also connected to Yemen, but not necessarily inside Yemen, maybe something somewhere down the line where I'll, I'll work on that. 
that will be like a great, <laughs> a great show to, to watch. Uh, any other thought or also like one of the other questions ask you if you find found the male filmmakers or Western filmmakers who are allies? Uh, what was the impact of film festival on your work? Anyone wants to share anything in that regard? I'd rather answer the first one. I, I, I think it doesn't, our stories are transnational. Like it's not just like uh, stories transcend. And I think, for example, I'm working on something now that crosses from Saudi to Yemen uh, to the US to like, I, I don't see a story as like, it, it, it rarely starts and ends in one place, right? There is a story that starts in Yemen and ends in Brazil, right? <laughs> it's like we're all connected in a way, but I feel a responsibility to represent and concentrate on that because I feel like that needs more voices, right? Uh, the, the voices of Yemeni experience in Amsterdam. Sara is one of the unique people that can do that, right? And, and so there, I, I feel like there is a responsibility to concentrate and be able to, uh, uh, to do more of those things. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, sure, I can go to Afghanistan, but I'll be, I'll be one of so many other journalists that's going to Afghanistan to cover that. Like, what is the added value of me doing something somewhere else? I always think of that. As an, what's my viewpoint in this, right? What, what do I, what can I add to this conversation that doesn't already exist within this sphere, right? I, everybody can do that. Uh, but for me, I need, I need to be addicted to the story. I need to wake up every day and think about it. Like I need to be obsessed with it, especially with long form journalism. It's that uh, you really have to live with it for a really long time, right? And like, so you have to make your peace. Yeah? And you, you chose the story, you're married to it. <laughs> you're going to live with it for a long, long, long time. And so am I going to be able to sustain that kind of interest in something else? Maybe, right? But, but that time commitment, I would much rather invest in, in stories on Saudi or Yemen. Like those to me are more valuable and they feed my soul in ways other stories wouldn't. Not that they are of less value, but to me, that is more important. Um, and I've been given, been given a chance to do those. So why would I? Like, I mean, we criticize that of like white middle-aged men flying into the Middle East and they don't even speak the language and they think they can tell our stories. I'm like, who are you? Like, why would I do that to another community? <laughs> right? Like, I, I feel like that's, that's a really problematic way of thinking uh, that you can tell any story. Okay, sure, you can tell any story, but what is your responsibility in telling that story? Yeah? And what is your positionality in it? And, and your, um, so yeah, sure, but why would I? We are nearing the end of our event. We have three minutes uh, left. Any final comments? Any, any points you want uh, to share with us? I would add just on to that. I know it's going back to the previous question, but I think it's, and I'll keep it short, but it's that thing of like, it's not saying, oh, would I make something here? Or would I make something there? Or da, 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 da. It's like, what resonates with me? Because this thing is going to be with me for a long time. Like I only know how to make things I'm obsessed with. So mm -hmm. um, because it takes so long, I, I wouldn't have the sticking power otherwise. So it's like, why does this resonate with me? Like, why do I want to do this? And usually it has to be something connected somehow you know and so you know that I cannot decide what resonates with me it just does you know if that makes sense so I think saying like would you write a book something from this person's book or so I wouldn't know unless I've read that book and it resonates with me or like you know but I have there has to be a personal connection otherwise why why am I doing it why so yeah. um and so yeah just to second that thing I think it's not those things are not such a logical thinking thing of like, oh, I might do this, or I might do that. It's, it comes from how am I connected to this story and how does it resonate in a way that I'm going to stay with it and live with it and breathe it every single day. Because that's- Also may I add do. the health of your bank account and yes. you to do something. <laughs> yeah. like, let's be honest about like, I'm a freelancer, so I'll speak for myself, but like 
sometimes you have to take jobs because you're going to starve if you don't, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and so there's a reality of that as well. It's like, okay, is it going to take only three weeks? Okay, yeah. <laughs> can I live with this? You know, like, so it, it, it's also, it, it, it sounds like we are in a, this luxurious, you know, we have all these choices, but really sometimes- I think I see there are different things. There are my passion um, things, that, uh, my, my, my passion and my absolute, I have to do this films, which are my feature uh-huh. films. But then there are things that I do because I have to earn a living, because I don't earn a living from, from the films, is that I, I work on other people's films as a, as a cinematographer or as a, a producer or production manager or whatever. And I enjoy that equally, but I, I go and I work and then I leave, you know, mm-hmm. like in, well, not fully, but I, it's a different way. But what I'm talking about, about the resonate, you know, the resonance is my passion projects. If I'm not like, ah, then I, I don't know, yeah. I don't do it. I mean, this is also like, is 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 there's the assumption sometimes that you're a filmmaker that if you just get given a good story then that's something that's going to immediately ignite some kind of passion in you to want to do it even if it's a really good book but if it's just there isn't the chemistry it's a bit like mm. I mean so what you mentioned a marriage it really is a marriage and sometimes it's it's a spark that happens you never know when it's going to happen and it's so unpredictable. Like I, I might say, yes, well, I did say, actually, I'm not going to make any films between now and X period because I just want to focus on this one thing. And you just don't know when the next love of your life is going to step into, your, <laughs> into, the, into the frame. And that's another story where you're obsessed and you're not making, you know, you don't know when you're going to make money from it. So you are having to like kind of keep your passions aside. And if somebody says, here's a really good book or here, I want you to make this film then it's almost like an arranged marriage in a way where, you know, it may or may not work. It may or, you know, it might, it might be an utter disaster, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of risky and it's not something that I, I really feel like the story comes first and then the decision, you know, the thinking comes later. Like usually it's just, I'm in it. Before I know, I'm already making a film. I'm like, well, how did I get here? I already, pl- I made a decision not to do this again. I made a decision not to be in the situation again. And yet here I am, you know? So it's it's not very, it's, I don't think there's a rational process where it's like, right, so here are like five proposals. Which one am I going to choose? Oh. It just lands on your lap and you have to have the passion and the the love for it to to battle through it for for years and years and years. Um, so yeah passion. and that might not always come in the same form as well I think that's I know we have to wrap up but that's something that I don't necessarily go I want to make a feature film I go oh here's a story what does it need to be what does this yeah. does this thing need to be a poem exactly. does it need mm-hmm. to be a feature film is it uh, I don't know a short film is it I don't know uh, a piece of theater like it's the story first I think it's like connecting with what Sarah was saying it's the story first and then I figure out what it needs to be and how it's going to be but that's the initial spark will, will dictate and and I think far too often people say I want to make a film rather than oh here's a story what does yeah. it need to be um yeah yeah sometimes it's not a film it can't be a film yeah. like you're forcing it into a film yeah. and it's a talking head thing I'm like why did I do this this is awful <laughs> like, yeah it should be a podcast or it should, it should be a podcast, podcast. Now my rule is my podcast is my recce, right? So if it works in the podcast, then you get a clear idea of like, okay, does it have a life as a film or not? Like this is this is how I'm getting my funding. <laughs> like, podcast, can you share the podcast <laughs> link with us all? Can we have the podcast link? I can. I we we're sharing all the links, right? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. One. Yeah. 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 No. No. Th- thank you for for reminding me. But like, it's 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 such a yeah like I haven't been able to like work on other people's projects like it's not in my personality I don't know how to do that like <laughs> please tell me how you do that like I I'll, every year I'm like this is what I'm going to do I am going to be an adult <laughs> and accept other people's projects <laughs> so I don't starve and then I fail completely <laughs> but, I'm in the same boat <laughs> yeah well one day we'll learn <laughs> I just really? wanted to note for our audiences because they are asking about the uh, links for your uh, films that when we are going to post this video actually on Jadalia, we are going to include the uh, links to the films and uh, to, to the podcast and to any additional uh, things that we mentioned during the talk. But I think this is the end of our panel. This was really inspiring. 
we are very grateful for you to join us uh, in this event 10 years on women's filmmaking and the aftermath of the uprising with uh, Naziha Arabi, Sarah Ishaq and Safa uh, Ahmed. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.